Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to another episode of Become a Better Man. My name is Tunde Disi. And as you can see, I am not alone today. I've got my daddy with me. I told you he's coming back. He's here. The doctor is in the house. It's an honor for us to have with us again today, Dr. Daniel Imoideme. Uh, for those of you who were not here in April when Dr. Imoideme was with us, I will highly recommend that you go and uh, watch that program. But don't worry, you haven't missed a lot because today is another day, today is another opportunity that Dr. Emoy Demme is going to open up the secret behind something that we all should know that we don't know. Dr. Emoy Demme is a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist with over 40 years of experience, especially in the area of reproductive medicine. So we have in, our, in the house today a man of authority, a man with experience, a man with years and years of practice. And therefore, we are privileged, ladies and gentlemen, to be able to sit and listen and watch, but more than that, and learn from this great man. I am so proud, hand on heart, I am so proud to call him my daddy because that's who he is to me. And today I want us to sit back, get your pen and your paper, because you will need it. Get your pen and paper to take note, to write things down, to jot down nuggets of wisdom, because they will be flowing freely today. What we're looking at today, I know Dr. Emoy Deme will go through all of that, but as a wealth introduction, what we're looking at today is an area that, in my opinion, sir, it's perhaps the most important lesson that a, that a person, especially a female, must get to know about herself. So we have this ringside seat today to learn as Dr. Emerdeme will take us through all of this. I will not take much of your time, but I will advise and I will encourage and I will beg your indulgence to please, let's go and share this program tonight. Let's call our friends, our families, our contacts, everybody that you know. Call them to tune in, to join us on this program tonight because I can tell you, it is going to be one of those programs that you'll be glad you were in it. Without much further ado, I will turn the table or the, the, the camera to Dr. Emoy Deme. But before I do that, one of the things we'll be doing tonight is Dr. Emoy Deme has prepared a PowerPoint presentation to aid the discussion because things that we'll be talking about tonight are quite very technical. But you will see graphical, pictorial, explanation that will go along with what he will be saying. So from time to time, you will not see us, you will see the PowerPoint presentation, but you can still hear our voices. So please, let's get the ball rolling. Dad, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, you, the last time you were here, you you said it again and again that this, this roof is, this house is half roof because we haven't said anything about the female side of it. Mm -hmm. It's an honor, sir, to have you with us again today as we look at the female side of reproductive medicine. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, you. Pastor. And um, yes, I, I will say the congratulations to the females because <laughs> uh, I wondered whether just looking at the male was uh, going to be sufficient. So perhaps uh, we have won. I will say congratulations to the females and they should say hooray. <laughs> hooray! <laughs> I'll say it on their behalf. So, uh, what uh, I have decided that we sh where we should be going is the basics. 
because without the basic, without understanding where we are coming from, it's very difficult to know why we are doing certain things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a journey. You're going on a journey, you need somebody, a guide to take you through it, but if he doesn't explain enough to you, you really wouldn't understand what exactly you are seeing at every stage of that journey. And that is what this is about. Mm -hmm. We're going to be looking at the female today because the female is quite, it got in all his wisdom, made the female quite different reproductively from the male. Mm. Uh, in the sense that at some point in their life, they start, they, they, they start reproduction and then end at some other point down the road. I always say to people, uh, God must have been so wise because I imagine if an 80-year-old woman was getting pregnant and carrying a pregnancy, what difficulty that would have created. Mm. Whereas a man, an 80-year-old man, can still have children, produce perms and all that stuff, doesn't take him anything to do that, doesn't take him nine months carrying a pregnancy and going through labor and all that. So, I thought we should look at the basic, the female in a much closer way in order to understand how their body works. And once we get that understanding, we'll be able to look at things like investigations down the road, you know, why we do certain investigations, why, what, of what importance they are, what sort of treatment will be useful and uh, why we choose a particular option of treatment. So the, 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 the title for today, uh, today's talk is, I say, From Birth to Senescence, but I still go a little further back before the birth of the baby girl, you know, and um, because when the baby girl is in the womb, uh, I would, uh, if, if we look at this, that this is, this is a, sl a slide, I think you may, you know, I presented this, this last time, because I said fertility is, 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 is something that involves two sides of the roof, one the male, the other the female, and today we are dealing with the female because we dealt with the male, but it's a, it's a spectrum of anomaly from a totally normal male and normal female being, you know, in a relationship or marriage to a partially normal with a normal, uh, a partially normal male with a, uh, a normal female or a totally abnormal male with a normal female. So as you get this spectrum and vice versa, you get difficulties in pregnancies happening. So this is the foundation of all of the stuff we'll be discussing during the whole of the program, that you can look at various anomalies, one being normal, the other one being slightly abnormal, or they both are completely abnormal in which sterility is the situation. So uh, it's a slide we will continue to see again and again in subsequent uh, discussion. Now, this is a very important slide. Uh, I know you are not seeing our faces, but I think, I, I, I think this is a very important one for everybody. I said a while ago that we'll go back before the baby girl is born. At about three to five months in pregnancy, a baby girl has anything between seven and 14 million eggs in their ovaries. By the time they are born, that has fallen to about one to two million. So dramatic. And wow. people will ask why? What happened to all the other eggs? We will talk about that. By the time they reach puberty, of the one to two million eggs that they were they still have there at the time of, of their delivery, they now have only two hundred to three hundred thousand eggs. They haven't 
had any period before then, they haven't had any baby, they have done nothing, and those eggs were actually normal eggs that we know can actually produce a baby if they were harvested, for example. That's hypothetically. At the age of 38, there are approximately about 25 to 30,000 eggs left of the 200 to 300,000 eggs left when uh, that were there at the time they had their first period at puberty. And by the time they get to menopause, menopause, everybody assumes that menopause means there are no more eggs. There are usually eggs in the ovary. You will still find eggs, but they are not good quality eggs. And you, various research and studies have shown that anything between 800 and 1,000 eggs may still be there in the ovary, but really they are of no use because they're not going through the process of maturing and creating good eggs that can lead to pregnancy. So overall, during the, 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 the reproductive life of a female, only about 40, 400 to 500 of the eggs that she initially had would be ovulated from which she will reproduce and have her children. So you can see the percentage I put there, I say it's 0.000036% of the eggs she had when she was in the womb at three to five months that will actually be ovulated, which are potential eggs for producing a baby. All right? So this is a very, very important thing to understand, a very important slide to understand that. Why is it that all these eggs are disappearing? Yes, okay, yeah. Why are all these eggs, why are all these eggs disappearing? We know that the process of egg production is, has to do with an interaction between the ovary and the brain a part of the brain we call the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Never mind my jargons, because I told Pastor this evening, before we started, that this is going to be the most difficult part of all this program for me to explain. Because when you're trying to explain technical things in layman's language, it can be a bit tricky. But I put it in a way that, you know, you have what we call the pituitary, which is in, in the head and the hypothalamus, and then the ovary uh, in the abdomen, interacting through certain hormone you know, change, exchanges, which helps to uh, mature these eggs, produce them, and let them get ovulated. But we know that... Uh, that's, that is, I, I hope you can see that slide. That's the slide I'm trying to explain. The hormones you would have heard about, FSH, LH, you know, if any one of you would have been to a doctor, and estradiol, inhibin is a much less relevant hormone. But the more important ones are the FSH and the LH and the estradiol. There's an interaction, what we call a crosstalk between the ovary and the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And this interaction of the hormones is what helps the eggs to start to mature and develop. But before a girl gets to puberty, the FSH is very low, estradiol is very low, nothing is happening. But she's still losing eggs. And again, that's another slide there. If you see a word there that is in red, I say it's apoptosis. You may not have heard about it before, excepting maybe some of you have done some biology in an advanced stage or, or, or so. It's a mechanism of programmed cell death. Even as we sit here talking, apoptosis is going on in our body. It is a mechanism by which the body regulates certain number of cells. Let's go back to the baby in the womb. It is by means of apoptosis that organs are formed and reformed. You know, things like fingers, hands, 
you know, all the various organs are reshaped and formed by the process of controlled apoptosis, a mechanism of programmed cells. That certain cells are programmed to die off so that others will survive. This is what happens also in the ovary. And this is the mechanism by which, for example, by which, you know, the egg loss in the ovary, you know, uh, at in, even when the baby is in the womb is, you know, is lost. So, it's a very important word and it's all across biology. As we sit here, as I say, yes, it's one of the things that is going on in our body. A number of cells are going abnormal, are doing something very, you know, uh, unhealthy. It is the program or the process of apo apoptosis that helps us to clear those cells and get rid of them from our body. So it's the same mechanism that reduces those egg numbers from, you know, say 12 or more million in the, in the ovary at about three months to 300,000 at the time of uh, uh, puberty. So the other mechanisms that lead to reduction in the number of eggs in the ovary are what we call exogenous factors. These are factors that do not necessarily relate to what is genetically determined, but factors that either because of our lifestyle or certain things that happen in our environment, we end up losing certain cells. It does happen to all of us. Now, it gives you an idea of what actually happens. If you look at, if you can see your, the slide clearly, I, I hope you do. Number one there, the very tiny little one on, the, on, the, on your left hand side of the slide is what we call the primordial uh, follicle or primordial oocyte. An oocyte is an egg. That is our, our own jargon for egg. When you see an oocyte, O-O-C-Y-T-E, uh, uh, then you know that is an egg we are talking about. Okay, that is the resting stage of all eggs in the ovary which we call the primordial follicle. You see, the central dark area is the actual egg proper. It has only a few cells sticking around it, and it's in the resting phase. And as, during that phase, as they are resting, some of them are gotten rid of because apoptosis takes out. We don't need that much of this lot of eggs and so on. Then, at puberty, what then happens? The process of selection of eggs starts. And if you remember the last time I mentioned a hormone called AMH, anti-Mullerian hormone. It's a hormone that I call a gatekeeper. I call it a gatekeeper because it does something very interesting. It is Produced by the by the uh, by the eggs, the the, the 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 oocyte in number two, three, four, and five. You will see because as the as the egg gets bigger, you can see the greenish part. Those are what we call granulosa cells. They are like nurse cells. They nurse the egg. The egg has no blood supply of its own. It's totally dependent on those cells. And it is also those cells that produce the anti-mullerian hormone. The anti-mullerian hormone that those cells produce as they grow is what then controls how many more come out from the resting phase. So you have the primordial follicle, which is number one. The AMH controls or keeps the gate and says, only so many of you are going to come out this month. Okay? And that's, you know, it shuts the gate at that point. And then they carry on growing. The AMH continues to be produced by the other cells. And at a further end, a further point down the road, between number five and six, it stops the eggs from maturing. 
So you only end up with only one egg that mature. All the others will die off by the process of apoptosis. Wow. There may be 150, 50 to 100 eggs released in one month, and only one will mature. It is the AMH that actually keeps the gate and says, look, we are going to have so many coming out this month, and so it keeps check on what is in reserve. And that's why we call also use it as a hormone that tells us about reserve, because we know that as the reserve falls, the AMH level also falls, because the number of eggs that are released in a month that will secrete the AMH will be also fewer. Okay, so this is the way the AMH keeps the gate and as well gives us an idea what is released. If I go back to explain it in a literal term, in a, a very like situation, if you have a lot of money in the bank, that's the way I used to explain it to my patients. If you have a lot of money in the bank, you can go to the bank and take out as much as you like. Mm -hmm. Let's say you got a hundred thousand pounds in the bank. And you would say you feel nice, you know, you're going shopping, you're buying things and all that. And you go to your bank and you say, bank manager, I need about a thousand pounds there. And he gives it to you and you walk away. Then a time comes when your account starts to fall lower. And the bank manager tells you, oh, well, now we are about 20,000 there. You can't take as much as 1,000 at every time now. That's what the AMH does. The AMH tells us that we only have that little left, as well as helps us to control how much we take out each month. But down the line as well, it controls how many eggs mature. That's why we don't end up with our, the women having five babies at once, ten babies, because they release up to 50, 100 eggs a month. So if you were to mature all of those eggs, then you could imagine what will happen down the line. Wow. So the body has a mechanism for controlling this process, and the AMH is a very crucial hormone, apart from telling us what is in the ovary, what is left, and what perhaps will be an estimated idea between now and menopause, when the woman actually goes through menopause, it also acts as a gatekeeper to make sure that we don't subject the women to too many babies being conceived and born and all that because the trauma of carrying, let's say, imagine a lady carrying six or seven or ten babies in one, you know, at a, at a time. It, it's, it's, it will be a disaster, I would, I would imagine. So the AMH is a very important hormone. One, as, a, as a, a mechanism of telling us how much we have left in our ovary and how much uh, we can produce maturity. If you look at this next slide, it, also, it tells you, it gives you an, uh, an idea exactly of what I've been talking about. You can see the AMH where it blocks at number one, it blocks any further primordial follicle going into the pool of those that are growing. And at number two, it blocks those that progress to maturity and, and, the, and the ovulation. So it controls those two gates, apart from giving us an idea where and how far do we have to menopause and how much have we got left? Now, let us look at, uh, that's, I've put that there really in terms of in words, the value of the AMH as a gatekeeper hormone, preventing an excessive recruitment of eggs from the reserve and preventing excessive number of eggs you know, from maturing and ovulating. And also it acts as an indirect indicator of fertility telling us how much have we got in reserve. It doesn't tell us how many eggs specifically. It gives us a qualitative, uh, some, if you have an AMH of say 20, you know, it will be a lot better than somebody who has an AMH of five. You know, you know that you've got a lot more in reserve than that person. 
and also it gives you a probable idea of how near menopause is. So that's the basic you know, value of the AMH hormone. It's a very important one and you invariably, I mean, I, I don't see that you will go to a clinic these days you know, to have an investigation for possible fertility treatment without having an AMH done because the doctor wants to know what are we dealing with here. Because the fewer the number of eggs in the ovary that are left, the, the fewer the good number of eggs that there are because of what our body is going through, because of the environmental issue, our lifestyle events and so on. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, this is, you know, let them say this one. Yeah, then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is an ovary showing you exactly what I've again been explaining. You know, you see that so many eggs came out initially and then gradually only one matures and ruptures and releases the egg they're leaving what we call the corpus lithium, which is what prepares the lining of the womb. This is the ovarian cycle, release of egg, gradual maturation, only one eventually maturing to ovulation, get, releasing the one egg, which then becomes a, usually the one baby. Occasionally, the AMH may get skipping, may not be that efficient, and then you end up with two eggs maturing and ovulating, or three eggs. That's where you have the occasional you know, twins and triplets, you know, spontaneous, non-IVF kind of uh, twins and triplets. So this is what we call the ovarian cycle, where you start recruiting the eggs, and in fact, from the point of recruiting the eggs, from the primordial follicle to ovulating them, it takes about 38 days. Although the normal menstrual cycle, you know, usually the average normal menstrual cycle is about 28, but it takes 38 days because the primordial follicle, the very, very young egg, has to grow to a point where it can actually go into the pool. Wow. So, it takes about 38 days to get there and then join the queue, the, the queue and then follow through with the process. Um, now we've talked about the ovary. The ovary is not the only thing that has to respond and prepare for pregnancy. The womb lining is a very, very crucial part of the equation. It's like saying, I want to have a precious seed to plant. I must prepare the soil so that this seed must do very well. Yeah. Okay. I, must, uh, I have a precious you know, seed to plant and I must prepare the soil very well. Nature does that through the hormones that are produced from the follicle, the egg that is growing. And the final one that matures and gets released eventually releases the final hormones that keeps the lining of the womb developing. It thickens it and prepares it for secreting glucose, which the baby relies on. The embryo in the early stages relies very much on for its uh, implantation and growth. In some situations, for no obvious reason, we find some women who have lining that does not respond to hormones. They have very thin linings, but they have good AMH. They have good AMH, they have good ovarian reserve, they are ovulating, but the lining of the womb is not doing well for reasons which we do not know. May well be genetic, may well be related to what may have happened while they were in the womb. So, this is a very important part of the equation as well, what we call the endometrial cycle. The growing, the thickening from what we call a proliferative, that is a growing phase of the, of the, of the lining of the womb, to what we then call a secretive phase. A secretory phase is that phase that now produces the nutrients that is when implantation actually happens. Without 
the secretory phase, you don't get implantation. Okay? And if the lining of the womb is too thin, then, you know, it's unlikely that you know, pregnancy will be established, irrespective of the beautiful embryos and the good AMH and all the rest of it that goes with normal fertility. Right. Yeah. Let me just... Okay. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I don't know about you, but some of the things I'm hearing here, as a man, it, it immediately put the fear of God in me, especially where women are concerned. Because we, we only see what's going, we only see the, the, what we see on the outside. But imagine all this process is going through a woman's body. Every minute, every second, every day. Gentlemen, on behalf of uh, all of and you. And ladies. No, this one is for gentlemen <laughs> for first. First, okay. Gentlemen, <laughs> on behalf of all of us men, whether you agree to it or not, it's immaterial. But on behalf of all men, all male species, ladies, I take off my hat. Accepting that he's not wearing one. I'm not wearing one, but <laughs> just imagine I take off my hat to all of you. Because if this is, I know this is natural. But if it is men that are going through this, I think we'll be complaining, we'll be griping, we'll be whinging, we'll be nasty. But the ladies, they will, it's like nothing is happening. And yet, the whole system is, is tumbling and... Yeah. Wow. Well yeah. done, ladies. <laughs> You're the best. And then you say women are the weaker self. Right. Um the lining of the womb again you know if there was no pregnancy it breaks down and it's a spontaneous event you know the blood vessels by themselves the body controls that shut off and kills the cells and then washes off everything and then we start all over again the very next month so this is what happens when you have the menstrual cycle you know it's the beginning of growing of the lining of the womb through the proliferative phase to the secretory phase, which is can sustain an embryo. And if no embryo has implanted, it breaks down and then it's completely washed out in a period. And then all over again, they start another cycle. So this is what you know, the endometrial cycle is, uh, is all about. Now, um, <clears throat> if I, this is uh, to let you, you know, I, the picture is not fully on the screen, but exactly what happens after the egg is released, is fertilized in the fallopian tube. It travels from the point of fertilization and entering the fallopian tube. It takes about five days of travel through the fallopian tube before it arrives in the cavity of the womb. You might imagine, why five days? You know, and the distance is only two and a half inches. It's a controlled mechanism, and at every stage, the nutrition of the embryo is changing. And the fallopian tube responds to the need at the specific point in the fallopian tube of the embryo in terms of the nutrition until it gets into the womb and implantation happens. And of course, for implantation happen, we just said to happen, we just said the lining of the womb has to be healthy and you know free of any uh, anomaly things that we will talk about in, in in further in future talks and uh, thick enough to sustain the embryo. Now, um, we know that regular ovulation takes place in about 90% of females at the age of 20. And regular menstruation takes place between, you know, uh, between the age, you know, uh, regular menstruation occurs in most women between the ages of 26 and, 20, and 44. 
but absence of ovulation then happens in a hundred percent of women at age 55 you rarely would find a woman who still menstruating and ovulating at the age of 55 usually if that happens you want to question whether there is a, a disease entity in there rather than ovulation so generally we usually say to a woman the only thing that makes a woman men that she has produced an egg that egg has matured fertilized or not fertilized ovulated and it has not become an embryo or it has become an embryo that is abnormal and therefore did not implant and therefore you know she's had a period that is the first principle a woman in the reproductive age under the age of 44 44 45 the first thing that you you know causes her to bleed will be her period if she does not have a period the next question you ask is there the possibility that she is pregnant it is when you rule out these two that you then begin to say is there any other problem out here that is the reason for them not having a period so uh, we also said earlier on uh, which I've also put on the slide on on the screen here I'm not sure if you can see that I'm not sure yeah this one yeah if you can see that slide I, I, I said earlier on that in the reproductive life of a woman between the first period and when she gets to menopause she will ovulate about 400 to 500 eggs that's approximately about 30 years of reproductive life starting from about say age of 12 or so you know when she has her first period so out of the four, nearly 12 14 million eggs that she had in the ovary when uh, she was in the womb so it's a uh, people will say what a waste but that is nature and uh, I, I don't call it a waste I call it regulation I call it respect for the dignity of women and for the work they do yes sir yes sir now what happens how the what is the pattern of loss of eggs in the female during the reproductive life we always say that before the age of 38 or this is I wish to express this that these are not hard facts you know it's an all or none situation biology is not all or none there will be those outliers you know where you know they, they don't follow the rules and they break the rules there are those who will have their you know the menopause in their 20s and there are those who are going to have it at 55 yes but generally how do females lose eggs from their eggs we say the loss is steady the release of eggs from the ovary is fairly steady up until the age of 37 38 then following that the loss of eggs becomes very rapid why the reason being that as the egg numbers fall, the AMH level begins to fall. So the, gap, the gatekeeping job of the AMH is not as efficiently done as it, it should ideally have been. So you have more eggs now being released into the system, you know, to mature. But at the same time, we know that a lot of these eggs are abnormal in quality because beyond the age of 37 38 you start to have a rising number of abnormal legs in uh, uh, in in the ovary so that is why we say that the chance of abnormal babies being born like down syndrome you know and all the various other anomalies associated with that is higher as a woman approaches the age of 40 you know and beyond okay now so you can see from the age of about 12 when they have their first period 
release of eggs is fairly regular. If you scan them every month, you see that they will release a fairly regular number of eggs. You will see it. You know, when we scan women, usually we scan them in the first five days of the of the of the menstrual cycle. Then you can tell what numbers, what sort of numbers they are they are they are, what we call follicle count, what sort of numbers they are releasing this month. But by the time they then get to the age 38, 39, and go into the 40s, that number would have fallen from somewhere where you get about 20 to 30 each ovary to about 5 or less than 5 in each ovary because the reserve is falling and the body wants to maximize the way of fertility and the gatekeeping uh, hormone is less effective now. So more are being released to go out into the pool and a lot of them are abnormal. The depletion is faster and you have a faster rate of you know, a downward trend towards uh, the menopause. Now, what are the hormonal evidences for what I'm saying? The earliest time that you can actually detect, you know, changes will usually be from age 35 onwards. You see a gradual rise in a hormone we call FSH. Because the FSH is produced by the, 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 the brain. Because the, usually the, 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 the ovary produces a hormone called estradiol, the female hormone, estrogen which tells the brain, I've got enough FSH here, I don't want more. Okay, so, but because the follicles are fewer and the eggs are fewer, the estradiol level that is produced is less and so the brain gets less of this estradiol level and less control and so it produces more and more FSH. <laughs> You know, saying, trying to drive the ovary to say, I want you to release more eggs. But normally, the ovary will respond and say, I've released enough through the, estradiol, uh, the estrogen uh, level. But when the, the number of eggs are fewer, then that control is, is markedly reduced. And then you start to have a rising FSH. Again, you, you will find that for those of you who have gone to... Uh, clinics, you'll find the doctors will talk usually first and foremost they'll talk about FSH but now we look at FSH as a secondary hormone, second class in terms of effectiveness in predicting outcome of treatment compared to AMH because AMH gives you an idea of what is left and does a gatekeeping job whereas FSH is only very useful for the particular month in which you're going to do the treatment. Whereas AMH predicts for you the next few years down the road what is likely to happen. AMH, I mean FSH predicts only for this month because this is the month that this batch of eggs have been released. They are producing the estrogen for this month and they are trying to tell the brain to stop producing FSH which stimulates more of these eggs to grow and if there are too few of them then of course you'll have a higher FSH but because the ovary has a low ovarian reserve no more eggs are likely to come out that yeah now I, don't, I want to talk to the ladies now this is like I can't even call it biology class. This is dissecting what you go through every day, especially every month during the menstrual cycle. If this is helping you, if you think you are learning, if some of what is being said here is giving you meaning and understanding of especially your system, your body, now you are, you are, you are having maybe a slight understanding of why you feel the way you feel, why you react the way you react, why you act the way you act, because somehow all these all hormones all must be affecting absolutely, mood absolutely. And, 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 and all of that. Absolutely. If this is helping you in any way, 
I want to hear from you. Say something. Write something. Let, let's, let's, let's make this interactive. Yes, I know you can't talk back, but the only way you can do that is to write something and let us know that this is actually adding values to you. So please, ladies, uh, I, I, I need you to respond. Thank you. Dad, please. Yeah. The slide I have on, on, this, on the screen is basically is, is what I'm saying. To emphasize the fact that nothing is fixed in, you know, nothing is fixed in terms of I have an FSH of this and therefore this is going to happen. My AMH is this and therefore this is going to happen. It's a relative thing. You can see what we ha I have on the screen there. It says the reproductive life uh, age or phase of the woman's age from minus 5, minus 2 to minus 3. As it go we are going towards the menopause as the numbers uh, increase. You will see it says it's variable. You know, it's the duration at which all of this happens is variable. Menopause transition is also variable, but the final menopausal age is more like relatively fixed. You know, the perimenopause or early menopause usually lasts about three, four, five years when you, you start to have irregular period, missed periods and all that. But the AMH will even tell you a lot earlier before period starts to be missed whether things are going in the direction that you know you per perhaps do not like it to go. The value of the AMH we will come to again in some of our discussion, but if I put it quickly here, that in the present day practice, given that women pursue careers for one reason or the other, or for economic reasons, Couples are not ready to start a family yet because of the cost, housing, you know, whatever. AMH can be a useful guide to say, look, I think I might as well just go on and freeze some of my eggs for the future. You know, people have actually talked about, for example, you know, theoretically, but not in practice, but you never know what happens in the future. We first of all start saying things in theory, and then eventually they become practice. Is a young girl has so much in her ovary. Why don't you get some of those eggs and preserve them so that, yeah, you know, a young girl has so much in her ovary, so many hundred thousand, so many millions in her ovary. Why don't we preserve some of those eggs and freeze them so that when she needs them, we can actually transplant them back to her ovary without having to do IVF and she can you know, use them and she can have children from them. That, this is a possibility. But in theory, it is something that we are looking at and discussing. But most societies will begin to look at, ah, isn't that too drastic? But again, Societies change. You know, I will say to you, for example, in, uh, in the 70s, when IVF first became, test tube baby first became, 1978, the first baby was born. People thought that this was weird. You know, we are trying to imitate God, we are trying to create this and all that. But society has changed and learned that this is nothing, it's not a challenge to God. In fact, God has given the wisdom and the knowledge for people to be able to do these things. So, again, who knows what will happen in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years' time. That a, a lady might say, look, in my family we have, you know, premature menopause. Our, 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 our females go to menopause in their 20s. Why don't we get them to have eggs harvested at the age of 15, 16, 17 and praise them. Then let them go through their education and go through whatever they want to. When they are ready for children, they can come and have those eggs transplanted to their ovaries. They don't have to go through IVF and people are 
women are beginning to have babies through those sort of uh, procedures. Their own eggs present at an early stage, put back into their ovaries. You know, and then they can start to have periods, and you know, even when they have previously become menopausal because they've lost all the remaining eggs, the ones that have been transplanted will be useful for them to have periods again and have babies. These are all thoughts that are going on as you know, discussions go on, science improves and all that stuff. So basically nothing is set in stone. Everything is variable. I cannot say I have a lady sitting in front of me, I'm telling you this is a fact, this is you and this is what is going to happen to you. No, it's a variable thing. Biology is variable and therefore we should look at it in that context. Not because what we've been saying here, some of it can make people feel depressed. And I know, I, I know the experience from, cl from clinical work, from talking to patients in clinic. And when you start to explain all of this AMH results and all the rest of it to them, they feel depressed, they start to cry and all that. But it's relative. It, they are not absolute, but it's just an indication that you perhaps need to be aware of possibilities. Mm. Okay? So that's uh, basically what all of this is about. It's not about trying to um, make anybody uh, feel unusual or a bit uneasy about things. Um, yes. Where are we? Yes. There's a question. Yes, okay. Did they say it's asking? Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Let me see if I can see. Yes, she said, does storing your egg cost or is it a, is it service that can be offered free of charge? I think in the UK uh, it's beginning to be accepted as a treatment that can be free of charge, just like sperm freezing. I think so. You know, um, I think they're beginning to look at it from that way because it depends on the society. If your society, people are vocal, they fight for their rights and all that stuff and so on, mm. people get what they ask for. But if people are silent and just, you know, don't do anything about it, then fine, you know, they never get what they really should have gotten. When I look at it, when one advises a lady, for example, to freeze eggs, usually we say at least three cycles of IVF. Three cycles of IVF up to the point of collecting the eggs but not putting embryos back. Those three cycles usually will cost somewhere in the region of about, uh, about 18,000 pounds. When, you know, it's, uh, this is about three, four years ago. Uh, it may well have come down. Government is changing its policy and as government changes policy, things get cheaper. Okay, so yes, but when you look at the cost benefit down the line, that if you have, and I always say to any lady, if I'm advising any lady to freeze store eggs, I say make sure you have at least 25 eggs stored. That gives you a chance of at least having a baby from those eggs. Okay. Yes, at least a baby from those 25. Because you're going to go through, some of them may not be quite good genetically. Some may not fertilize. Some may fertilize and not give rise to good embryo. But you do then have a good chance that you will have a baby, at least one, from those eggs. So, freezing techniques are improving dramatically. Um... I was involved in some of the pioneering work in freezing eggs technique, we published some work as far back as 1992, which became the foundation, the basis for uh, which eggs were being frozen. But since the last eight to ten years, a new technique has come into, uh, into uh, come online, and it's proven to be a little better, you know, more secure, producing 
you know, uh, better results in terms of egg yield when you, when you defrost the egg. Because when I did that work, nobody knew what exactly, you know, everybody was scared to freeze eggs. And then until that work was published, and then people started to bear into it and look at it. And the Australians picked it up and developed it a bit more, and it became something that became international. But now there's what they call vitrification, which is a much gentler procedure, I think, on the egg. And the yield is a lot better. Okay, so I don't think people need to be scared. Is there something that you, you sit back and say, where am I? What is my image? I have told girls who work with us, you know, even those who work in our clinics, women, they, they are scared to do their AMH. I said, go and do it. Why do you get scared? You have the opportunity here. Do it and know where you are. At least you can plan. You can plan. You know, if your boyfriend or your uh, husband or has been saying, oh, let's wait another year, let's wait next two years and all that, we haven't got this. And Look, let us go and have the baby first. <laughs> <laughs> let's go and have the baby first. And then we can look for the money later yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, these are all things that you can discuss because if you are not if you don't have the information, they say information, I mean knowledge is power. That's what it said. You know, if you have the information, then you have the power to make decisions and decide where you want to go up with your life. So it's a very important thing that yes, uh, I know it's a bit scary all the stuff I'm saying. You know, to some people it can be scary. I have seen it day in, day out in clinics. You know, young, old, whatever, they will cry. You know, but when the when the crying is done and we come to reality, they realize that after all, it's not that bad. Mm. Because if I waited another two, three, four years down the line, maybe things would have been worse. Mm. You know, so this is a uh, this is a uh, uh, the the. That's, this is again something that uh, I, I wanted to show you that not all eggs, uh, we have a saying in our, in, uh, in, our, in, our, in our local colloquial language that eggs are eggs but some are rotten, you know. We, this, this slide here was part of some research work I did somewhere, I published that in 2000, you know. Um, it was a research work that I, I was prompted to do because of a, couple, a man, a Nigerian man, who came with three of his wives, one after the other, to my clinic. And there were differences. The same man, eggs, you know, that, you know, where some of them, one of the wives, Eggs were not fertilizing, even if they fertilized, the embryos were poor. So I had to go and look why are some, you know, and we did two or three cycles and she came back the same way and she was young, 24. And I said, okay, look, let us find out whether or not there is a reason why this is happening. And if you remember the, the diagram I showed you, I said the nurse cells that nourish the egg because the egg has no blood no supply blood of its own. Yep. I decided to go on and look at those cells because if you imagine that you are a general fighting a war, you have a lot of soldiers around you. The stronger your soldiers, the stronger you are, mm -hmm. those around you, the less likely that the enemy will catch you. Yeah. But the weaker your soldiers, the more the likely the enemy will Yes, this is the thing. So that was the, the philosophy on which I carried out this work. And I then find out that the viability of those cells, you know, was actually pre can predict which egg is likely to fertilize and those that are unlikely to fertilize. You can see from the, 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 the pile diagram, I mean the column diagram that I have here, the dark blue ones are those ones who had poor scores. And the fertilizing ability was lower. Okay, so as the viability score increases, the number of eggs that uh, fertilized were better. In fact, his 37-year-old wife 
had better fertilization rate than the 24-year-old wife. So that was, the, again, it all the logic of all I've been saying. Yes, yeah. the logic of all that I've been saying. Numbers alone don't, make the, 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 don't give you the answer. There must be something else. But since this research, one has done a lot more to find ways to combat or prevent this sort of thing happening. And I, I think there are solutions to that now, you know, which can be uh, utilized to improve the quality of the egg, you know, by using antioxidants and all that stuff for months before the treatment. You can improve the quality of the egg and the, improve the quality of the uh, nurse cells, or we call them granulosa cells, around the egg. So. That's an example of what can go wrong. It's not just the AMH. It's not just the ovarian reserve. It's not just the number of eggs that are released per month. It's not just the lining of the womb. The quality, the nurse cells that nurse, that administer nutrition, bring nutrition from the blood to the egg can also be very important. Um, now, uh, we have, I've, I've shown you that slide, and we've looked at this one as well. Uh, yeah. Mm. Please, please, please send in your questions now. We, 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 we are short of time, so let's, please send your questions now. Let's look now. at uh, the age-related uh, genetic anomaly, you know, we say that when a woman is less than 35, about 25% of the eggs that she produces are genetically abnormal. So in fact, even an 18-year-old girl will still have chromosomally genetically abnormal eggs. If you carry on and get 10 eggs from her, you may find that only six of them are good. So it's not all eggs. The age alone doesn't tell the, the whole story. And we know that when, as age goes beyond the 35, 37 year uh, stage, the number that are abnormal continue to increase. And we say up to the age of 40, you begin to have about 40, 44 percent uh, uh, of the eggs that are abnormal. Now, let us look at things that can create problems. If I give, give I gave a, an example, the last talk I did, I said there was a, a girl who was 18 years old and was trying to donate eggs for her auntie. And I did, uh, in the pr process of preparing her, she was in higher school, in the process of pre preparing her, we, I found that she had an, a very low AMH and her auntie had become menopausal before she was 40. And it was only after that I asked about her own mother. Her own mother actually became menopausal before she was 40. Wow. So, there is a history in the family of early menopause. early menopause. And that is because the reserve of eggs in the ovary, with, by which the child was born with, was low. Those women were born with. It does run in the family. But there are other things that can cause egg reserve to fall in a child that is in the womb. Example of these are smoking. Uh -oh. If a girl, for example, smokes not only during pregnancy, I'm not talking about just during pregnancy. We now know that if a girl smokes, her daughter before, smokes before she gets to menopause. Her daughter is likely to get to menopause early and to have low ovarian reserve. And her daughter's daughter, is her, like, granddaughter. her granddaughter, is likely to suffer fertility problems. That is the newest information coming out now in the last eight months. The finding that there is a pattern that a woman smokes, her daughter is having, you know, her daughter has fertility problems. She smoked years before. Her granddaughter is reflecting the same pattern of event. 
And that's something that's very, I, when I first read about it, I was scared of it. That look, that is a transgenerational, you know, carryover of a lifestyle event to the life of somebody else, three generations down the line. So these are things that can happen. Lifestyle event, alcohol, dietary habit, you know, high carbohydrates, you know, uh, you know, diets, sugar, high sugar diets, obesity, and all that. We know that all these cause problems for the quality of the eggs that can be developed. Other aspects are chemical agents that we are exposed to pesticide in our, in, in our, especially in our part of the world, for example. All our food. Cosmetics. These are they contain all sorts of things that we know. Sorry, can, yes. Cosmetics. Cosmetics. Yes. A lot of cosmetics contain things that, you know, when you see, uh, so what is, the coloring agent e something 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 e what, they give you a number. You have no idea what that number is. You know, but we, we you use them. Okay. <laughs> you know, women dye their hair. We deliberately say to women, if you're going to go through fertility treatment, please stay clear of dyes for some time. Because those things get into your system. They impact on air quality that you're going to, you know, you're going to produce. You know, so you want to be free of them. You know, a lot of stuff that happens, that a lot is coming out now that we still are not very sure how to deal with the situation. But cosmetics is one of those things. Pesticides is another thing. Other chemicals like, you know, for cleaning homes and all that stuff and so on. We are exposed to all of these things and they do have their carryover. Perhaps one will say yes. Is a question of relative, relative amount. A relative amount of this will do that. We even know that environmental particle, nitric nitric oxide in the in the in the in the in the environment can impact on the quality of the air that can that you know, a lady can have. Snoring, for example, is an, a lifestyle event that can impact on the quality of the eggs that a woman has. Okay, for a woman. Yeah, it does have also impact on the male. Okay, so we are talking of women today, so I, I'm not <laughs> talking. It does have an impact because people do not, certain things that we, we take for granted are beginning to come to the, to the surface as part of what we can be suffering from because they have an adverse effect on us, which we have never known. No. Mm. Okay, so these are all the sort of uh, problems that can happen. Where I mean, lifestyle events, smoking, even passive smoking—that's something that you know uh, that, you spoke that about I spoke life. about. Mm. Passive smoking, your husband smokes, you know, kick him out, <laughs> let him go and smoke outside. You know, if he smokes in the car, no more smoking in the car because when he smokes, you are smoking if he smokes around you. You are smoking and you are developing, maybe at a milder rate, but on the long term, you will have the side effects of those sort of problems. Um, occupation, night shifts can influence and affect the quality of what happened because we now know that what we call inflammatory changes, oxidative changes that can impact on the egg reserve happen more in people who do not sleep enough or have who do night shifts. We know that miscarriages happen more in air flight attendants, for example. We know that fertility in males who are mountain climbers is lower, you know. Who go to ever the Everest and all that high altitude and all that stuff and so on. So these are things that we are beginning to see as lifestyle events that are impacting on fertility. So it's the whole idea is not to scare anybody because that's why that's I don't know how much how to put it, but 
that's why I said it's a, this is the most difficult part of this discussion that I'll be having because all of what I'm saying is like, hey, maybe I should emigrate from this <laughs> from whole this island. You know, <laughs> you know that to be said. No, whatever we can do in our individual lives and as members of society to contribute to getting things better, we should all aim at doing it. You know, because it helps us all. You know, there's a lot of talk about the disappearing male. I mentioned it briefly, you know. Uh, who knows whether we, the, the, the man will be here in another half a million years. Nobody knows. We may well have disappeared. Because if you see the difference in the size of the chromosome, the female chromosome and the male chromosome, the male chromosome is probably about a tenth the size of the female X chromosome. So, the Y chromosome is gradually disappearing. We don't know why. We, nobody can quite explain it as, as yet. Is it our environment? Is it what we are doing? Nobody quite knows yet. But this is about women today, so let's leave that as that. Dad, uh, how much have we got? Uh, let me slide. see. I think we're almost uh, uh, there. You know, these are all about you know, uh, all the hydrocarbons, cigarette, uh, chemotherapeutic agent, uh, you know, radiation, you know, things that can cause eggs to be depleted in the ovary. And in, finally, I mean, you know, the last, this is the last one, okay. you know, summarizing what we've said, that a woman is partly what she's endowed with when she was born, and partly what her life experience, her life journey has been, her genetics and how her body manages her, over, uh, her eggs in terms of apoptosis, the programmed cell death, and then external factors, the life that she has lived, you know, what sort of things she's been exposed to, has she been smoking, has she been drinking, has she been you know, exposed to, you know, chemical agents, you know, you work in a chemical factory, for example, uh, you work in a, an area of radiation, you know, uh, like working in a nuclear, uh, what is it, you know, power Plus, station, yes. you know, all of these things can affect and impact on reproductive ability. Therefore, <laughs> we... Have a role. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I like this. What? <laughs> Sorry. Auntie Kate just wrote, he said, Now I understand why my husband never allowed me to wear makeup when we were in courtship. Bless you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that, that's why she has all those beautiful children. <laughs> ah, ah. For those of you who don't know, Auntie Kate is Dr. Emoidemer's <laughs> wife. <so. laughs> oh, thank you, sir. My goodness. Right. Um, I think there's so much, there's so much, because what I've tried to condense a huge amount of information into a very small period of time. What I've talked about today can be the, the subject of three separate lectures. But at least we have a little peep into what the problems can be and what can happen. So we hope that in the next sessions we will be able to look at how to decipher some of this problem, investigative procedures, how to overcome them, and what we can do to improve the situation. We've talked about egg preservation. Embryo preservation is another one. Genetic testing of eggs is another one. There are lots and lots of stuff that can be talked about, but I hope that you've got something out of what we have said today. Uh, it's a lot. It's, it took me quite days trying to condense this, trying to make it reasonable in a layman's language as much as I can. But I hope, even if it hasn't been excellent, I've managed to give you some information, you know, and that as we go along this program, 
you will now begin to recall some of this information as we ask for certain things, as we do certain investigations, as we do uh, certain forms of treatment, decide what is and what is not, and then you will recall all of this and it makes more sense at that time because this is a very technical area uh, in terms of uh, this subject. So, ladies, I hope you've had your day <laughs> and uh, I'm happy that uh, you actually did and uh, because I, I believe that I always say that uh, reproductive health is even in the clinic I say to, to I say 80% the woman the 20% the man the 20% I divide it into what his contribution is in terms of uh, the sperm he has 10% and the rest supportive you know supporting the lady that's where she, he's called the 20% mm -hmm. because it's so much whatever the cause of fertility the woman carries the burden of whatever is going to be done wow. you know so um, I thank you all for listening and I hope you've made a something out of it uh, questions I would like to answer if uh, there are um, if there if you can't remember any now you can keep them for the future and maybe we might have uh, a session where we devote a good part of the discussion to questions you may have had mm -hmm. at different previous sessions mm -hmm. and all that so everything makes sense yes. Wow, wow, wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a day we have had. What a session we have had. On behalf of all of you, Dad, thank you, sir. Thank you to the women. Thank you. They, they, they wanted it. And they got it. <laughs> no, thank you, sir, for, for sharing this. Uh, Pastor Chris Ogedengbe said something earlier on. She said, wow. All this information given to us free. Thank you, Dad. We honor you. We appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I said uh, at the beginning of the month that Dr. Emoideme has gracefully, graciously agreed to be with us on this platform throughout this month of, month, of, of June, every Thursday. What you have heard today, what you have seen today, is a tip of the iceberg. Like he said, all these things that we've tried to compress into an hour, an hour, ten minutes program, is about three days of at least two hours yeah. for each, each of, the, of the three days. And so we, we have really compressed it. Now, good as that is, to whom much is given, much is expected. You have heard something tonight. I hope you have learned something tonight. The challenge, the, your part now is to go and tell somebody else about this. Share this on your platform. Share it with your contacts. Share it with your groups. Let somebody else benefit from this knowledge that is being given to us freely on this platform today. Uh, it has been an excellent time. I have learned a lot. And as a man, I have received, I have gained a deeper understanding of the nature, the life, and the inner working of a woman. And that has really raised the bar for me as far as my wife and my daughters and any other women or female around me as far as my relationship with them is concerned. And I'm using this also as, a, as, as an opportunity to put a call out to all men out there. If you have heard what is being shared tonight, or if you are watching this after this program has ended, you owe it to go and honor your wife, your daughter, every female in your life. Because doctor just said it, when it comes to 
reproductive medicine or reproductive health, the woman carries 80%. The man's portion is only about 10 it is only if he's supportive that he gets a, 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 ten, a bonus ten. of 10 more months. <laughs> so imagine that. So please, let's go and share this program. Let's talk about it. Let's, and also, like doctor said, let's start piling up our questions. You can email them to theadmirals at yahoo.com. Theadmirals at yahoo.com. So that I can bank all these questions. We will have about half a session before the end of the month where all these questions will be, will be, we will we'll look into it, we'll, doctor will treat it, we will answer Even them. Even if we'll, it's personal questions, yes. individual, you know, uh, you know, problems you've had, I'm prepared to give you an idea, my own idea of what the way forward, you know. So, uh, yeah. There That's you it. go. There you go. So, let's go and make this a record-breaking program. Not because of the crowd, but because of the benefit, the blessing that it will be in the lives of others that are not on this platform now, but will know about it, will hear about it, will listen and watch this program from your timeline, from your contact, and from your sharing. Once again, that... Thank you so much. We honor you. It has been wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for all those of you who have spared your time and left whatever you had planned for the evening to listen to this very, I would say it's a bit boring, but <laughs> okay. Very informative. You know, whatever you make of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, once again, this is Tunde Disu saying, until next week, when we meet again on this platform, become a better man. This is Tunde Disu reminding you that our determination, our concrete determination is that we refuse, we will not stop, we will not be derailed, we will not be discouraged until we'll, we arrive at that destination called better man. And better woman. And I look forward to seeing you there. So until next week. Better family. Better family. <laughs> God bless you. Bye bye. <laughs>